The race is on around the world to find a treatment for coronavirus. A prominent doctor featured in the hit docuseries Pandemic says he has made a hopeful discovery. And TJ Holmes has all those details for us. Good morning, TJ. Hey, good morning to you, Robach. And you said it right. This is a race. This is a global race now involving scientists, doctors, and labs all over the world. And they're not racing each other. This is a race against time to find something that works. We're told a vaccine could be 18 months away. This doctor says he has a treatment that is ready to go right now. New hope this morning as scientists around the world collaborate and focus their efforts on finding a treatment for COVID-19. It's good to have big dreams. Big dreams got us to the moon. Dr. Jacob Glanville featured on the Netflix series Pandemic for his work on a universal influenza vaccine is now working on what he calls a candidate cure for coronavirus. Glanville's company is taking antibodies that were effective in 2002 in fighting the SARS outbreak and modifying them in a lab to make them fight COVID-19. And he says it's working. Our challenge is right now is a race against time to be able to manufacture them quickly enough and to distribute them out to people who need them all over the world. He says the next step is for the military to confirm his findings and test the antibodies on live coronavirus. Then accelerated human trials this summer. And if all goes according to plan, he says a possible treatment could be ready by September. I think there are at least 50 groups that are all working on this, and that's good. Um, there's only one competitor in this space. And that's the virus. While biomedical research and vaccine trials are underway, other possible treatments are already being tested across the U.S. We have a vaccine that's on track and multiple other candidates. So I would anticipate that, you know, a year to a year and a half, we'd be able to do it under an emergency use. Some experts believe a vaccine could take longer. This week, the first patients began receiving convalescent plasma transfusions, blood plasma from recovered coronavirus patients, which contains antibodies that doctors hope might help those who are still sick. Um, I'm glad that this turned into a positive thing. 36-year-old Jason Garcia, who tested positive for COVID-19 last month and has since recovered, donated his blood plasma to treat another patient now in ICU. I'm kind of hopeful that the story gets out there and more people start contacting hospitals and be like, yeah, I've been symptom-free for a while now and um, I'm, I can donate my plasma. <laughs> and help others. If the potential therapy works, plasma from recovered individuals could be in high demand. And several NBA players who had coronavirus, including Marcus Smart of the Boston Celtics, are volunteering for the program. A Dr. Glanville says his treatment would work as something of a short-term vaccine. You could take it and it would start working immediately, immediately and it'd be like a vaccine for three or up to six months. And I have to give people an update, Robach, on this chloroquine. You're hearing so much about that has potential to work, this medicine. Well, uh, the word got out that it could work, and the FDA says this week there's now a shortage of chloroquine in the world. Wow, my goodness, not surprising though. TJ, thank you so much. Let's bring back in Dr. Jen and Tom Bossert, our contributor and former Homeland Security Advisor. And Dr. Jen, I'm gonna begin with you because we just heard TJ reference it, the new data out of China that those anti-malaria drugs that are now in high demand and perhaps even in shortage in some areas that has been used to treat uh, coronavirus patients. What is the new data out there? Well, first of all, Amy, we have to remember that drug hydroxychloroquine is also used for patients with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and now they can't find the medication that they need to take every single day. But this new study out of China, very small, just 62 patients, they compared a group with mild illness, one got standard of care, one got standard of care with hydroxychloroquine. Again, the, the group that got the hydroxychloroquine had one day shortening of their symptoms. None progressed in terms of severity in the group that just got standard of care without the drug. Four went on to develop pneumonia. So again, early data, there are some risks to this medication, a potential um, irregular heart rate that could be serious or fatal. So it, it's not ready for prime time yet, but some encouraging data little by little. Okay, and then the mayors of New York and Los Angeles, we just heard, are now recommending that everyone who goes outside wear those face masks. And of course, this flies in the face of what we've been told for all of these weeks leading up to those announcements. What should people think? What should people do at this point? 
I think it comes down to this, Amy. First of all, there is limited data when you talk about home cloth masks, N95, surgical masks for this type of scenario. We always have said, and this is still true, that you put a mask on someone who is ill to prevent those viral particles from going out. So this consideration, if the CDC and the World Health Organization does an about face, is to protect others. It's not to protect the wearer. And you have to value risk versus benefit. There's pretty low risk to wearing it. There may be a benefit. And, and Tom, I'd like to, to ask you a question for a second here. The New York Times, they use analysis from cell phone um, um, location data, and it showed in certain parts of the country, people are still venturing at least two miles away from home. And that was as recent as last week. Or do you think Americans are doing enough to defeat this virus? Yeah, Michael, the answer to that is no. And that data suggests something worse. It's not just that people are traveling that they're traveling from their community to other communities, and that's a pretty good proxy for them coming into contact with other people. That's the problem. Distance doesn't matter, but when you're close to someone, that's when you start doing what Dr. Jen will tell you, all the things, sharing droplets and all the things that communicate this disease. So people need to get the message, and they need to get it across the country. And the former head of the FDA show so far, the U.S. is on a slower trajectory than, than Spain and also than Italy. But Vice President Pence, he compares the U.S. to Italy, which was totally devastated by the coronavirus. Do the numbers show that we are on that trajectory, that we should be compared to Italy, which was very hard hit? Yeah, Michael, one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen made through this entire process is data aggregation. You know, if you were to average North Dakota and New York, it would make New York look less you know, scary and it would make North Dakota look more scary. And both would be false. So. I think it's fair to say Italy is comparing unfavor favorably, unfortunately, to Lombardy, Italy. But that doesn't mean that every city in the country will look like Italy with their level of devastation. That's, I think, the mistake that we've seen in that messaging. Well, unfortunately, is right. And I hope that everybody does heed the warnings to stay apart so we can all be together eventually. Tom Bothard, Jen Ashton, thank you both so much. Well, hey there, GMA fans. Robin Roberts here. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Lots of great stuff here. So go on, click the subscribe button right over, right over here to get more of awesome videos and content from GMA every day, anytime. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the morning on GMA.